Hello, and welcome to our fourth uh, edition, or maybe it's our fourth meeting of the Globe and Mail Craft Club. Um, we've developed quite a community here these past eight weeks, so I wanted to start off today with a shout out to some of our regulars out there, um, our super soapers, Jay Laird and Susan Melanson, my favorite craft family, the Catrans, and Stacy. I hope you convinced your son to try stitching and that you're keeping your family tradition going. Um, I also want to say hello to any folks who may be joining us from the Drumheller Public Library. Hooray for libraries. Um, and to our craft club cats that sometimes show up on the Facebook page, uh, Sassy and Millie. It's wonderful to have you all here. And to everyone else, whether you're joining us uh, for the first time, whether you've been here these whole eight weeks, or whether you're just uh, watching the video later, it is so wonderful to have you here. Um, I'm Jana Pruden. I'm normally a crime reporter and a feature writer at The Globe and Mail. And uh, for the past eight weeks, I've been hosting our sort of pop-up pandemic craft club as we work on learning creative, productive new skills uh, during this very strange time. Um, we like to do things really informally, and I guess I'm in a way I'm sort of recreating what it would be like if we were all hanging out in my living room making something together. So please feel free to get into the chat and ask questions, tell us where you're joining from, or just say hi. We love hearing from you. Um, I also really encourage you to share your work, whether it's stuff you're making with us in the club or other projects that you've got going. Um, you can find us on our Facebook page, Globe Craft Club, or by email, audience at globeandmail.com. And I really encourage you to sign up for our parenting and relationships newsletter, um, which is running updates and links from the club and also collecting and uh, sharing pictures of the amazing work that people have been making. If you have been part of the club for a while, you'll know that the soaps, the collages, the delicious crackers people have been making are really astounding, so fun to see. Um, and also I do encourage you to subscribe to The Globe and Mail, of course. The Globe and Mail makes this all possible. And um, as a bonus, a new newspaper subscription is great for collages, paper mache, all the other crafts you want to make. Um, so today we're gonna be learning basic embroidery. And I think we have some folks from the Toronto Guild of Stitchery who are watching today. So this is gonna be very, very basic for you, uh, but hopefully you have your hoops and you just have a nice time stitching with us. Um, I took up embroidery about a dozen years ago, totally on a whim, I ordered a kit uh, and I immediately loved it. And there were many things that I loved about it. It was so inexpensive. I soon learned that with a dollar's worth of thread, you could stitch a lot of things. Uh, I was very environmental. I buy a lot of my thread and also the things I stitch onto from secondhand stores. Um, and it's just so creative. The sky is the limit in terms of what you're stitching. And for those of us who are um, like a little bit of instant gratification, you could sit down to watch an episode of your favorite Netflix show. And by the time it's over, you could have stitched a pillowcase. And I went through a phase where I stitched every pillowcase in my household and then some. Um, and I became, I used to joke that I was a bit of a embroidery evangelist. I thought everybody should take up this hobby because it was the greatest hobby. And anyone who remotely wanted to learn, I wanted to teach them. And I would tell people, you know, 15 minutes, I can teach you to embroider. Um, and I'm not the best embroiderer by any means. I'm a little bit of a rogue embroiderer, I would say. So one of those people is my dear friend, Netta Semnani. And uh, Netta just immediately jumped into embroidery and then took it in directions totally different than what I had ever done, totally uh, different than the way I had ever seen stitching. And so when I thought about this class, I thought it would be really interesting to have Netta join us um, and to come back and teach embroidery to me, the style that, that she does and the way that she approaches it. And also to talk about the role embroidery has played in her life. Um, 
those of you who have been here for a few classes now, you'll know that, you know, the making of the thing is part of it, but there is a lot of other parts of it as well. Um, Netta is a brilliant journalist and writer. She's based in New York, and she is so pregnant that she may actually go into labor during our class today. Uh, but she has promised me that if it happens, she will keep stitching. And, uh, you know, we like a little bit of element of danger and excitement here. So uh, that just continues that. Um, welcome, Netta. It's so wonderful to see you. Well, it's so lovely to be here. I miss you. So it's, this is such a treat for me. Uh, it is such you. a treat for me, too. Um, do you remember the first time we embroidered together? The first time we embroidered together in the same room, I want to say it was during our friend it is, friend's residency. Is that right? Yeah. And I came up to, when I went to Edmonton and stayed with you and we wrote and we stitched. Oh, that was such a brilliant, not only did Jana teach me like firsthand how to embroider, I mean, I'd been embroidering for a while, but then she taught me how to make a fur hat, <laughs> <laughs> which is, just such a specific Canadian skill, <laughs> it feels like. Um, so I have my little fur hat from. <laughs> That's right. Um, so what do you think uh, appealed to you about embroidery when you when you started to embroider and when you started to get into it? What did you like about it? Um, it's so, well, I think... I don't know, maybe this is like too much information to jump into right away, but I was in a pretty, I mean, you know this, it doesn't matter. I was in a pretty dark place when you taught me. Um, and you you taught me long distance. So it was more like you sent me, if it, I don't even know how, how it came up. I, to be honest, I can't remember. Um, but my memory is you sent me off with like a list of goods. And then I don't remember if we were on the phone or... I we must have been, um, but I think I couldn't wait for us to actually connect. So what I so I just got my needle and I like maybe texted you a couple questions, um, and then maybe I did a Google or something before we actually sat down and did stitching together. Um, and it just there's something about it that feels so meditative, and it feels. I mean, there's the instant gratification, but there's also, um, like, I couldn't stop stitching in the in the best way. I mean, I was I was really hurting at the time, and um, and so I just remember, like, anything that wasn't like nailed down, and even some of the things that were would just get like pulled up, and then like I would. <laughs> I would stitch like I don't even know if you remember like I would send you pictures of like canvases from like that I pulled off the wall and I was like I don't know am I doing this right and you <laughs> you must you put up with a lot <laughs> so th this is you know a warning and also a sales pitch for embroidery that that you can embroider anything that you have I've embroidered clothes, as I said, pillowcases, cushion covers, um, napkins, tablecloths, any, pretty much any fabric you can embroider on. What are you going to be embroidering on today, Netta? Um, I actually, I, it's one of those, um, like, fancy, I don't know, I bought a set of sheets, and they came in these, like, random um, linen bags that we've been sitting around being like, what are we going to do with these bags? So they look kind of like this. I'm not trying to give and you know, do any sort of advertisement, but I, so I have had these pile of random bags that I've now cut up. Um, so I'm going to be doing it off of that, which makes me feel a little bit good about not wasting, um, a thing. Um, I and I have a uh, sort of a napkin or possibly handkerchief that I bought. Um, I bought a big pile of them at a secondhand store, um, just really plain white cotton. And I'm going to be stitching onto that. So as anyone joining us knows, um, we did make a template of our Craft Club logo. Um, this is just something for us to work on. It was sometimes called a sampler to try different uh, stitches. 
But um, let's talk a little bit about um, choosing a pattern. Where do you, how do you decide what you're going to stitch? Where do you look for patterns? I mean, it depends. I mean, honestly, sometimes it depends on the mood. Like I have, um, you remember those uh, adult coloring books that were super popular a few years ago? So I actually bought a bunch of them on, um, on clearance or whatever. Like they don't, you know, you can find them anywhere now. Um, and actually coloring books are kind of great. Magazines are great. And I'll just, sometimes if I don't have an idea, I'll just be flipping through. And if something catches my eye, then I'll tear out the page or sometimes I'll Xerox it. Um, and then this is a Jana Pruden original, uh, suggestion is the carbon paper. And once I learned about carbon paper, that has changed my world. So that's what, if you have carbon paper, I would, um, you know, obviously you put that over your fabric. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, going back to your question, basically it's, if I'm kind of don't have any ideas, I will go to a magazine or like you said, the Globe and Mail, a newspaper, um, or a coloring book, honestly, like even a kid's coloring book, and then rip that out and start from there. I do a lot of free drawing too. I'm not good at drawing at all, but that's kind of the thing I like um, You don't actually have to be super, I mean, some people are very specific and almost mathematical. I don't love that um, because that's not how I work. I'm more of a cook than a baker, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so that's like, how do you find what you want to do do you yeah. come in with a plan all the time I'm glad you mentioned coloring books I think coloring books are great because they do have this kind of um basic uh line drawing approach I've also used I've done lots of tattoos based or lots of embroidery based on tattoo flash if you like sort of that style you could look up vintage tattoo flash um, I of course if I'm I have terrible handwriting so if I'm doing if I want some words I will do it on the computer and take a screen grab or print it out and then I can use that to trace over and um, there's definitely lots of techniques for putting your pattern on the paper um, as Netta was mentioning there's you know waxes you can use there's different markers I personally once I settled on um, carbon paper and a pencil I've never really gone back do you do any of the iron-on things or anything like that Netta no I don't but when I um so I use generally pencil um on, if it's lighter and then I have a ch chalk marker um that I use on darker fabrics um and yeah that's pretty much you know it's pretty simple in terms of like um, but actually what you, the trick that you gave me for not having, my printer wasn't working. Um, so Jana also had a trick where you just put your paper over your, um, computer screen. You like turn it, the light all the way up and then you can trace it on the screen, which was really, which was helpful in this case, but also reminded me that that has now opened up the internet in a whole new way. <laughs> um, so I've also fun. done that on a on a window where if you have a printout and you don't have any carbon paper, you could actually tape the printout to the window and hold your fabric up or tape your fabric up. But I wonder if we should start putting our um, doing our our tracing. Do you have any tips? I mean, I basically just go through with a somewhat no. dull pencil. Do you? Um, I am using today. I'm using a. Um, a pen and not a pencil, mostly because um, I haven't used this fabric before, so I'm not sure how it'll transfer or how easily it'll transfer. And it's easier for me to keep an eye on my lines and press down with this type of pen, which is just you know, your standard whatever. Um, but I know you like pencil a lot. I tend to just use my <laughs> embroidery method is what is lying around and how can I get quickly, can I start stitching? <laughs> um, 
Jana's a little bit more methodical. <laughs> um, really, really not. Um, I think some of our quilters and stitchers who are very careful are probably, this might be driving them crazy watching me just uh, go after this right now. Um, one thing to do, obviously, is to figure out where you want your design to be on your piece of fabric and also make sure that there's um, enough room that your hoop will be able to go around the design. So say if you're doing it on the side of a pillowcase or something, uh, just be a little cognizant of that. And then I like to just check, you know, look under and make sure it's actually transferring, um, which mine is. So here we are drawing. As we're doing our transferring, Neda, I want to show everybody a present that I'm giving you, but you're going to have to close your eyes because you can't uh, see it yet. I'm okay. I'm going to look down. I'm not even. Okay. Looking. Don't you dare look at the screen. Promise. I'm not looking. I okay. swear I'm not. I'm um, not. So Patrick's going to, <laughs> Patrick's going to put up a picture um, that you, that, I, so I've commissioned my cousin to make this. Um, my cousin does this craft that I know some people in the club do. Um, and so hopefully you can all see it. Um, it also has some elements of Neda's passions and work in it. And um, yeah, hopefully it's up there. I can't tell if it is or not, but I'm so excited about it. My cousin did the most beautiful job and I would like to learn this particular skill one day. Um, I, Next. oh, sorry. You can look up now anytime. I think it's off the screen. I didn't see it. Um, this design with the, the letters, uh, there's sort of a double block there. I'm being super lazy and I'm just filling them in. I don't know if you can see that. I'm not going to stitch all the way around each letter. I'm just going to stitch one line per letter. Um, yeah, so we have pretty serious embroiderers and quilters. I've always wanted to learn how to quilt. My next, my next project. So, uh, mm -hmm. as we're doing this, okay, so, um, I am, I have a note here that your main shot is glitchy. Um, and you're freezing a little bit. Is there anybody oh. in your house streaming? That's one question that's being asked because they're uh, in trouble. If they are. They shouldn't be. Um, there shouldn't be anybody on the internet, but um, I can't. Yes. Should it not be plugged? I wonder, um, they're asking if your computer is plugged in. It is plugged in, yeah. Plugged should, in. It, should I? Um, I'm not hearing. They're, they're going to drop it and call you back. So don't unplug it. Um, they'll drop it and call you back. And luckily, everybody's just hopefully transferring their pattern right now. And I will... Um, just do a song and dance if we lose you momentarily. We stop my little. Okay, so Netta is gone momentarily as we try to adjust that um, technical issue. Hopefully I'm still here and the rest of you are still here. Um, and whether you are making this logo or another logo or design um, or even freehanding. My back. Um, so I am still here and people can still see me. So that's good that I'm not doing anything crazy. And I've actually um, just uh, finished my... Um, outline and I'm going to check it out and it's looking quite good to me. Uh, there I see Nada's back. Hello. Hello. Um, so my transfer 
is a little bit light. So what I'm going to do, I mean, you get, no one will be able to see it. So what I'm going to do is just quickly go over the basic parts of it, and just darken it, which is something that I often have to do. Yeah, um, I, mean, I think this is something that we see if you use a bumpier fabric, um, there's a certain kind of pillowcase or um, cushion cover that I love to embroider on from Ikea. It has a thicker weave to it. So often after I put a design on, I um, will then sketch over it in pencil, which is what Netta is doing uh, right now. Um, I've gone ahead and put my hoop in. Maybe I should have been. It's almost like my hands were just doing it without even thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Ned, I had a question earlier from someone about um, wooden hoops versus plastic hoops. Do you have a feeling about that? Um, I don't. Um, I tend to use whatever. I tend to use both. Um, kind of, I like wooden hoops for, um, mostly because I, they're, I don't know. It's just easier, especially if you're doing something that you know you're going to want to give to somebody or um, that you're going to want to put on the wall. That's just, it's just a nicer look. Um, but if, for example, um, if, for example, but when I'm traveling, because I, I tend to stitch as I travel, um, then, then I, and the plastic ones work really well. And I actually have this vintage one that I actually think you gave me, um, which is my favorite. Uh, it's like, like this metal hoop, which I'm going to be using tonight. Kind of like this. And, yeah. Yeah. So you here's like, a, oh, sorry. You like plastic, don't you? Um, I have a couple hoops that are my favorite hoops, but I'm a little bit flexible. Um, I'm, I do buy a lot of hoops secondhand, um, you know, yard sale, secondhand stores often have a great supply of hoops and thread. Um, and as Netta pointed out, wooden hoops are so great. We sometimes see people will, um, after the design is done, take it out of the hoop, paint the hoop, and then put it back in. And so it can hang on the wall like that. Um, but yeah, my favorite hoops are plastic. I've gone ahead and put it in the hoop. I don't know if um, that needs um, much explanation. We're still having some problems with the stream. So hopefully if you're out there, just bear with us. We're trying to get it sorted out. Um, so yeah, please bear with us. Um, so I'm just going to put this back in the hoop again for anyone who missed it the first time. You basically want to be centering your design in your hoop and um, you loosen the little thing and then you kind of want it flat. You don't want to pull it. Uh, this can be a little bit delicate. You don't want to stretch it too tight where it's going to distort the fabric or distort the design but you really want it to be nice and taut so that um, you, you know, you're stitching on a, a flat surface and you're not drawing the material with you. So sometimes I actually kind of gather it in my hand underneath and um, then tighten it up so you have a nice tightness. And I'm not trying to take all of the class away from Netta, but we're hoping her stream will clear up a little bit, which does seem to be maybe. Okay, great. Are you um, there? Yeah. Can you I, see me? I Perfect. can. So, um, because my transfer was a little bit loosey goosey, as it seems my stream is, um, Jana has the perfect transfer. And then this is more of an everyday we're all going to I don't know if you can even see it um that's more of yeah my style which is a little bit we're gonna just make it work um but so now that we have transferred we have our design you have your hoop sort of um now now's the fun part now we get to stitch 
So, um, so a s- embroidery floss has six threads. Um, and, and so you can, the fun part about that is that you can figure out what thickness you want for your, your lines. Um, and it also can, as you keep stitching, I use that thickness to like, if I'm doing water or if I'm doing, you know, a thin line, you can play with that, um, and figure out what your favorite sort of thickness is. I like a three string, um, stitch. You can go obviously thicker or, um, thinner depending on your, the, um, the eye of the needle. But I I generally stretch it so it goes from the end of my, um, from my fingers to about the middle of my chest. And then I cut that. Um, Jana, do you use all six, uh, do you use a thicker floss or a thinner one? Um, So a good question. So we're we're taking um, about... An arm's length is a is a good amount usually, um, and I, there's this question: What's the best way to thread the embroidery needle? And I think that partly um, relates to this idea of how many threads we're using. So yes, these six threads. You said you like to use three typically. I do three. Um, there's something very satisfying. Um, I don't know if there's embroidery etiquette about licking your thread. (laughs) I lick my thread. (laughs) Yes. Um, I was just going to say, that's pretty much the best way to thread the needle. So making sure that you have, um, I guess the, if you're using all six, you're going to need a bigger needle. Um, And then there are those, do you ever use the little silver things in sewing kits? (laughs) Yeah, I I have them and I've never actually managed to use them. So I tend to be pretty, yeah, um, but they're very pretty and I have like six of them. <laughs> um, I just don't use them because <laughs> this is much easier for me and I have my favorite needle. I don't know if everybody has their favorite needle. It's not very exciting, but you can tell that I use it a lot because it's blackened in the middle. Um, and then this is also maybe controversial. I do a knot at the bottom. Um, I know some people don't do knots. I don't know how they embroider without knotting their bottom, but I do it. Um, and, and then comes the fun part. So Did my, you- I'm going to do two threads. That's my favorite. And you'll find if you're pulling the threads apart um, at home, You sort of, there's a little bit of a technique to make sure you don't just get a big jumble. You sort of have to untwist it as you go. Um, I did just lick the top of the thread. Again, it's a good question whether that's an embroidery faux pas or not. Um, And then we have a question here. Any concern that the tracing will come off on the thread or stay on the material? Have you had that as an issue? Yeah, sometimes it comes off on the material, um, which is why I go over it um, with a pencil or pen over and over again. Um, But yeah, and so that actually happens quite a bit for me. I know it doesn't, it might, Jana has a perfect transfer, so it might not for her. Um, And then since we're using darker thread, it really shouldn't transfer um, onto the thread itself. Uh, but if you were using, and actually I don't think it never, it ever has transferred onto the thread itself for me. Um, Mm -hmm. but for sure it fades on the the parchment. Um, Mm -hmm. so that's something to think about. Is there another question? Yeah. About, um, threading the embroidery needle. So, um, yeah, just to reiterate, uh, it's easier to thread if you use, thinner um, or a smaller number of threads. So me threading with two of the strands was pretty easy. If you're gonna use all six, which makes a real chunky line, um, you'll need a bit of a thicker needle. It might even, the needle that I'm using right now, I don't think I would be, well, maybe. Um, It would be hard to thread all six in here. 
Um, getting it a little bit uh, wet with <laughs> moisture will help. Um, you know, having a magnifying glass, if it's an eyesight issue, having a magnifying glass or if there's someone in your house with great eyesight and steady hands, uh, you know, asking them is a great idea. Um, so Alison Chambers asking, uh, does it matter what color we start with? Um, what do you say to that, Netta? No, I mean, I don't think so. I think you should start with whatever color is going to make you happy. You, this should be something that feels really good. Um, yeah, so start with. I wasn't feeling, for example, I wasn't feeling black tonight. I went with a green. Um, that does seem more calming to me. Or, or having yeah. to talk a bunch of people. <laughs> but Jen has a bunch of colors in front of her. Yes, I have many colors. I have a massive pile of embroidery thread beside me. Um, and so in a general sense, if you're thinking about a design, I actually do a lot of work that's just in black. Um, but if you're thinking about a design, you may want to put some time in advance, you know, in this one, I would think, okay, what color do I want the handle of the scissors to be? What color do I want that little piece of thread to be? So maybe planning in advance, um, but in terms of where you actually start uh, or which color you start with, doesn't really matter. Um, starting if you're very new to this, starting with a dark color makes some sense just because it'll be easier for you to see, you know, how your stitches are going and get the, the hang of it, I think. Um, Sherry Federley is asking, do we not both ends? No, or at least I don't. Um, I do one end, the, the back end. Um, so when I pull it through, it'll stop. But otherwise, no. Um, yeah, not until I get to the end. And just to, yeah, depending on your design, yeah, what Jan is saying is totally right. If you're going to do, like, you can do so much. Um, you can shave, you can do all that. Um, but for a design like this, I mean, you can still go ham on this um, and do a really cool, like, shading and fill it out. And you can do, we're going to show you a satin stitch, which um, a little later, which can really, um, yeah, make you, make shading really fun and you can fill it in. And so it could really be a patch. Um, I was going to start with, um, well, Jenna, I was going to start with one of the lines around, um, start at the circumference of it, yeah. um, of the, the, uh, design. Does that sound good to you? Yeah, that does make sense to me. So, and we had someone asking about what we're going to stitch first. I think starting on the outside makes a lot of sense because that can just be a really simple stitch. And I just want to point out, um, you know, before I started stitching, I always thought um, that, you know, you pulled the needle through and then you tied both ends together at the end. Um, then I later learned that you actually, and if you can see it here, one end is gonna be loose and one end is tied. So just making sure to everyone, you just really have one long piece of thread. It's two strands, but one long piece, and we have one little knot in the end. Um, I'm also getting a request for you to orient your hoop more towards your camera. So if that, Okay, and now we're good to go. We've over, overcome all kinds of obstacles, technical <laughs> glitches, um, you know, various um, things. And here, now we have a piece of thread, we have our hoop, we have our design. Uh, how do we start? Okay, well, since it's a circle, the fun part of a circle is we're gonna start in one of the outside rims. I've, for inexplicable reasons, decided to start at the first um sorry the 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 inside uh, you know this you can see what i'm doing right here there is one ring around there so i would stick your let me actually do this from the beginning um stick your needle from below the hoop from inside not um on top underneath so that it comes out Excuse me. Um, that was my bad. I got two excited 
stitch. Good Lord. Um, so you want it to come from below the hoop out. Jen, are you on there? Um, Waiting for me. <laughs> Here I am in mid stitch. And I do have to apologize for everyone. We had no technical or um, any kind of problems in our test. We do multiple, multiple tests. And for some reason, I guess maybe everyone in your building is watching Netflix right now and uh, messing up our um, <laughs> reception. You so we definitely apologize for that. And uh, hopefully it was getting better there for a while. So I'm going to hope it stays. Um, here I am mid stitch and I'm dying to go like a race car driver. So just to reiterate in case Nada is still still looking a bit glitchy to me. Um, so we're coming up from the bottom uh, in any place you want to start, drawing the needle through, and then it should stop because it has a knot on the end of it. So don't yank it hard, obviously, because you might bring it out. And then what? And then we were going to we were going to do a back stitch first, which sounds like you're learning to walk backwards, but I promise it is a very easy stitch. Um, so you pull your, your thread through and then you just very simply stick the needle, maybe, I don't know, a centimeter, two centimeters behind um, where, where that initial hole was or, you know, where you initially poked through. So then it looks very simply one stitch, um, pretty standard stitch. And then you'll go forward, I'm sorry, or backwards, I guess. Um, do you see where my needle is popping up? Can you see where the needle is popping out? Um, it's about, you'll go about two centimeters, three centimeters um, down the, down line. Um, and once you get there, you're going to go back to that first hole and you're going to pull your thread through. So it's going to act like one line. Um, and then you'll do it again. So again, you'll go two, three centimeters, Stick your needle through, pull it taut. I mean, not, you know, overdo it, but pull it taut. Go back to that first hole or, or the previous, and you'll pull your needle through again. And it should just be one continuous line. Um, is that working for people? It it is, and so I've had a bit of drama here that I'm going to show people. I have a little bit of a knot. This this can happen sometimes. You just pulling it too quickly. I'm going to try to get it out just by oh yeah, carefully like pulling that thread up. So um, here I'll just do the the stitch that Netta was just showing us. So I've come up on the line. I'm going to go back we see close up my drawing is not as good as it looked at a distance <laughs> so I'm going back and then actually coming forward so as Netta said it gives the impression of a solid line so you're going one step back and one step forward and this is when you start uh, meditating and you you know, tell someone a story, <laughs> you or you gossip, or you put on some music, and all of your problems disappear. Like how's, get glitch. <laughs> <laughs> how's that going for everybody? Is there anybody, um, everyone, getting the hang of that? Once you once you get it, it can be a little hard to uh, explain at first. It's like learning a board game. I was trying to teach someone cribbage a while ago and when you actually describe the rules of cribbage it sounds very complicated and then once you know how to play it all makes sense and uh you know once you've done this stitch a few times it becomes completely completely natural uh -huh. i just wanted to go back to that question about um 
removing the design um, from the fabric because you will get some traces of that in the fabric. Um, I have used Dawn dish soap because I like to, once I have embroidered something, I'll wash, um, you know, hand wash it, wash any of the, the marks off. And Dawn dish soap was a trick that uh, grandma taught me, <laughs> not my grandma, but someone's grandma. And um, it works really well for taking off any leftovers of the design. Um, so yeah, I'm a good point. Yeah. Now, because before you start, I mean, again, if you're doing something that you're really excited about, that's going to be a lot of work that you're excited to give us a gift, then you might want to do a little wash of your material and an iron beforehand and the transfer will happen much more easily. Um, but also it'll just, it'll be a smoother, it'll be a smoother ride, a smoother sail, one might say through your design. Is everyone getting stitches? Is everyone like feeling good about the back stitch? Um, I hope so. I'm not getting any, uh, questions at the moment I assume that's probably because everyone's hands are busy stitching um Neda do you want to talk a little bit about um you know that this these things that you started to get from from stitching you you know as you told us earlier that was a bit of a difficult time in your life you were dealing with some things and why do you think that stitching was helpful <laughs> Um, I think because, well, I mean, this is one of the things about, I think, crafting, but stitching and needlework specifically. I think um, there's something ancient about it. I know that probably sounds a little bit overblown to some people, but there is something that feels um, almost instinctive once you get a rhythm down. It's for me, it connected me, I felt very connected to history um, as a, you know, as a woman, as a Middle Eastern woman. Um, my family, my great grandmother was a seamstress and my grandmother did embroidery. My, I mean, I didn't know my great grandmother and my grandmother never taught me, but there's something about it that feels like in the best way. I don't know, like all of a sudden I felt just part of a lineage, which helped me in a moment where I felt very disconnected. Um, I just moved to, I had moved relatively recently to a new city. I was struggling with my work. Um, it was just, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's just a hard time um, in finding that connection. And there's something about, um, Jenna, you and I have talked about this, that like, when you are stitching, when you're crafting, when you're putting your time and energy into a thing, it's almost like you infuse that thing um, with wherever you are in that moment. Um, and if what you need is healing, for me anyway, what I felt like I needed was was direction and healing and, and just this feeling that uh, things will be okay. Um, so that, you know, sitting around for hours, you know, truly hours, I gave myself purple tunnel. Um, it felt that eventually it just, it just felt like I was suturing myself back together. So, yeah. Um, we have yeah. a couple of questions here. Um, one from Bass. Does direction matter? I'm left-handed and feel like going the other way. Um, what do you think about that, Nada? No, I mean, I think as long as you're going, you're doing the, you know, you're going back that once you're doing that one stitch back to go forward, if that means for you going in, um, the opposite direction, I think that should be fine. As long as it kind of looks like the, the line is, you know, the line is coming together and it's an unbroken line more or less. Mm -hmm. I think you're good. Um, so this is a very good question. How hard to pull on the thread slash fabric? That's a great question. Um, 
Don't over pull because I have done that. And it depends on also on your fabric. Um, the fabric I'm using is a little bit more delicate than I would like to or that I normally would use. Yeah. So I a fabric like, like this. Uh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, I was just going to say, I feel like this is... Um, that's a really a key thing to make sure you're not puckering it, but also if it's too loose, the stitches can look a little bit saggy. Um, do you hold mm -hmm. your finger like behind the stitches? Um, I do just to know where, yeah. um, where my, yeah, where my last one was. And I'll also, um, uh, I don't know if you you guys can see it, but what I'll also do to make sure that I'm on this the right line is I'll kind of push my needle gently behind it so I can see it kind of coming up, and then I'll stick my needle through. Um, but yeah, I mean, I also think that you'll figure out what kind of yanking is for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yanking is a pretty easy thing for me. Um, so it's that, and once again, once you get a rhythm down, for me, that's like the key part of it is finding my rhythm with the stitches. Um, and that means not pushing too hard, not pulling too hard, um, mm -hmm. not, as Jan said, not puckering and not creating kind of big old holes. Um, you kind of want it to be smooth. And this There's is where just keeping um, a finger on the back can be really helpful. I remember one of the first pieces I did and I was so proud of it. And then I looked at the back of it and it was all a big jumble of um, knotted thread. So you really want to not have knots on the back if possible. Um, mm -hmm. So Mary Lou has a question. Do you go down the same hole or just near the stitch when you're doing the back stitch? I try to go um, through sorry, the Janet. hole. Yeah. So do you go yeah, I know. through the same hole or just near the stitch? For a back stitch, you go through the same hole. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it might not always be exact, I guess, depending how careful of a stitcher you are. When I look at mine, I'm not sure I'm always going in the same hole. But yes, uh, that's sort of the ideal. And if you can see here... Um, that just going straight back into the hole that you just left. Um, question from Judy, and I just did this and I maybe should have <laughs> pointed it out as I was doing it. How do I end one piece of thread and start the next? Um, I know? just had to get there. Oh, So perfect. if you just hold on one second, I can lead you through. I had to go put some lights on. The, the light is changing so quickly these days that um, it used to, I could rely on a certain type of darkness. Now it's light. So um, uh, Judy and Vass, what do you do when you run out of thread and need to start again? So conveniently, that's exactly the point that Netta's at and she's going to walk you through it. Yeah. So when, um, when you kind of get to where you feel like you play chicken with that, the end of the thread as much as possible. Um, I, some people can go all the way to the tippity end. I, I don't. Um, but anyway, so you, you flip your hoop over. This is how I do it. Flip the hoop over. And while there's still a little bit of give, um, I, well, actually, let me, show you in the beginning um sorry like Jana I just end up doing things automatically um so I will I will do a little I will make sure there's a little bit of a gap. I hope you guys can see it um between the thread and the end of the thread so it's like almost like a little yeah a little loop-de-loop -loop where I can make a knot and here is how I do it. I just make a little knot with my needle and I pull that, not too tight, but you know, so the knot holds. And then I take beautiful little sewing scissors, which I gotten along the way in my travels. 
a little bird and I snap it um, and it should hold. And then I don't know if it's helpful, but I can re-thread re our needles um, and then I can show you how to pick up from where you left off. Um, and then you'll feel very powerful. <laughs> um, so then we re-thread the needle. Although, let's see. Um, Jana, where are you in your... Well, I'm cross? closing in on closing the, the hoop. I'm kind of motoring here. Um, yeah. So that I will show people uh, nodding on mine as well. Great. So you, again, remember we knot the bottom uh, of the thread. You don't have to knot both sides, or you shouldn't knot both sides. Um, make a good knot there, and then um, so for a back stitch to restart back stitch, um, wherever you ended it, go forward. You know two centimeters, or whatever, however small and tight your stitch was. Um, go forward, pull out the thread, uh, and then you'll go back. You pick up right where you left off, like a conversation, and you pull it through, and you pick it up again. Um, and it looks like I'm getting pretty close to the end of my um, that particular line. So once we get there, that Jana's already there. But once I get there, I can show you two different ways. Or maybe I don't know how Jana's going to do it, whether she's got that line where it lives or she's going to move along a different way. But I can show you two different ways for us to move through our design, our sample. So I'm just going to, as you'll see, I just completed this circle here, my inner circle out of black. Um, and so I'm just turning it over. I'm going to tie off. People do have many different um, techniques for this and more careful sewers uh, have really nice ways they make knots. I, again, I'm a bit of a rogue embroiderer, so I often just do a little knot <laughs> like that. Again, bringing it taut um, and then, I don't know, sometimes I do a couple just to make sure it's going to stay and then cutting off its little tail, just like Nada said. And I think I might switch colors for our next um, area. So Ooh. I wonder, you were going to teach us a couple of different stitches. Um, and so I'm thinking maybe I'll do this, this outer line. I'll pick a different color. Are you ready to move on to another stitch? I could sit here stitching all night, but, um, you know, people yeah. <laughs> may have something well, else to do. I don't know. I think probably another stitch that is really useful. So now I know how to do a basic, you know, you, you can line a thing now. Um, and so now let's fill in. Um, we did the inner circle. Um, and this is kind of my way of cheating. Uh, Jenna is doing a different color, but I'm going to show you how to do the satin stitch, um, which I have no idea why it's named that outside of the fact that probably because it's tightly woven together and then it maybe looks a little satiny. <laughs> um, you can do a pretty basic satin stitch, which is for me, we're on the inner line, go straight to the outer, that outer circle line, that outer rather, and you'll stitch from the bottom to the top. You'll keep it pretty close. So I think as close as you can without, um, yeah. Can you um, move your camera closer? And I think, so I was gonna pull these apart and do two two strands again, 
if we're going to do a filling in stitch, I actually think I might keep it all six because um, that'll, of course, fill in quickly because it's thicker. So um, here we are going to see if all six fit into this one needle um, mm -hmm. using this. Let's see. Again, some things that help. OK, I got it through. I tend to be pretty good at threading needles. So um, just and just to reiterate to everyone. So there you can see that I um, threaded the needle. Uh, threaded the thread and then I'm going to just put a little knot at the end of it here and then I'm going to do this satin, satin stitch. I'm a backstitch person. I do almost everything in backstitch so this is going to be interesting. Um, so Netta you're coming <laughs> up <laughs> you're coming up underneath from underneath I um, just want to make sure that people can see what I'm doing here. So you're coming up from underneath. This is the way that we always start and totally makes sense when you think it through because you have the knot on the bottom. You obviously don't want a knot on the front of your piece. So we're yeah. just uh, tying a knot, drawing up from the bottom. And uh, so then we can see there's my uh, stitch coming through and so the way that you're doing this is to just go from the coming up at the inner edge and coming down at the outer edge. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, you can obviously do it the other way as well. The key is um, for this stitch is to just make sure that the, the stitches are pretty close together. Again, it's a filling in stitch. Um, and you can play with it. Like I will show you a piece I'm working on now. Um, again, using a version of this stitch to shade to fill out. It's nowhere near done, but um, but it might give you an idea. Um, of it's really versatile stitch. Uh, when you see you go on Instagram and you see these really cool, um, I don't know, pictures of animals or plants, people generally use some version of this uh, stitch to kind of to, to do that. Um, but it's also a really practical stitch. You, you can make an outline so quickly, um, like a thick outline you can frame a piece, all of that stuff. Um, are so you I've, I'm just going to show people, I did get a little tangle on the back. That's one of the things about keeping your finger there is that you can feel. So then I'm just like kind of picking it out, make sure everything's straight again, and then pull it tight and start again. So um, Netta, will you do an outline? Would you do an outline on the outer line as well, or this satin stitch is going to become our entire outline? I mean, this is, well, I think this, I mean, we're running, I'm just cognizant of time. So um, I would, if I had all the time in the world, I would have done a back stitch um, and then maybe done a satin stitch in between. Um, but this, since I'm treating this as a sampler, a way for you guys to get to know different stitches, uh, you can either keep this, depending on how tight your stitches are. Um, can you guys see how closely I'm stitching each one of these to kind of keep it sort of a block? Mm. I don't think I would go back and retrace it. Uh, but... But if you're somebody who really likes precision, if you are a baker instead of a cook, definitely go back and like, um, and sm it'll feel smoother, I think, for most, for a lot of people. It'll feel like a tighter, more complete um, picture that way. Um, but I, I'm, I'm kind of, it feels more like a, Girl Scout patch this way. <laughs> um, and you can show you. 
Um, do you need a line to do satin stitch? No. no. So, not necessarily. Um, so, I use satin stitch. Actually, I'm using it. I'm doing this weird pattern. Um, I've been doing a series of, like, the snake eating its own tail. Um, so, I've been doing, I don't know if you guys can see, I've been using this a, a thinner satin stitch as my outline. Um, so, I don't know. As like, once you learn these stitches, you can just so you can play with them so, in so many different ways. Sorry, Jana, you asked me a question before I. Um, uh, no, that was just the um, this question from Bass. Do you need a line to do satin stitch? I think this is the idea that's so great about a sampler, which is to try out the stitches. And you know, they don't have to be perfect. Um, you can also cut them out more than once. I've, you know, cut out a bunch of stitches and start started again. Um, but they really are so versatile. And uh, once you learn, you know, a couple of basic stitches, you can do almost anything with them. And then of course there is uh, really a multitude of other stitches that you can try as well if that's the style of embroidery that you like. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I don't know, are people feeling comfortable with this stitch? I mean, obviously the reason why it's called a satin stitch, like if you ever get some um, embroidered, like a name or something embroidered on, I don't know, your towels or your blankets, it's generally this is the stitch that mm -hmm. the machine does for you. One thing um, that people might be noticing as they're watching, so I have with six threads on here, I mean, you can see the... Um, that there's more drag coming out of the fabric. I'm having to push a little harder to get it into the fabric versus when I had only two strands. Um, so definitely a difference there. These are looking a little, <laughs> a little messy. Don't judge me, stitchery guilt people. Um, I do have this product that I love. I swear that you know they haven't paid me to endorse them. It's called Thread Heaven. Um, and you just actually like drag your thread through it. And when you're using thicker thread, um, it can actually be just makes it a little bit more slippery. So let's see if that if that made a difference. Um, one of the questions is, what is the hardest stitch? Oh, um, I don't know what the hardest stitch is. There is. Um... There's a stitch that I haven't quite mastered. Well, I haven't mastered it at all. Um, but I've been trying for years. Um, there is uh, there's a you know a traditional Mexican embroidery um, that I've I'm obsessed with and in love with and would love to learn. Um, and unfortunately, I can't find a class in near me. Um, so that I've been trying to learn through, you know, Googling and trying to find YouTube clips and stuff. And it's, it's always comes out a bit messy for me. Um, but yeah, the rest of them, I've, I think the thing is, I'm sure there's like an impossible stitch out there um, that if you... Find the right tutorial. Most stitches I've found can be, you know, you can you can champion them after a while. Um, I think a sampler again is the right way to do it because it's all practice mm -hmm. and your finger kind of that muscle memory kicking in. Um, but what uh, and a lot of like the more complicated stitches or they look complicated and really beautiful, um, when you break them down, don't tend to be that difficult. I don't, I don't think. Janet, is there a stitch that has flummoxed to you? No, I, I think you're, I think you're right. I mean, there's certain styles of stitching that I think are very difficult. Um, you know, it all depends how intricate the stitches are, how little the stitches are. And that's one of the beautiful things 
about it is that it can be as challenging as you want to make it. Um, I see Netta's frozen again, but one of the things when she was talking earlier about sort of connection with culture, embroidery is amazing because we see it in almost every culture and it's, um, you know, in such a wide variety of ways from say, you know, indigenous Métis stitching um, and beading to Ukrainian stitching to Iranian stitching to, um, you know, Chinese stitching. It, we see them, we see it in every culture and expressed in such a wide variety of ways. It's really an amazing art form that way. Um, Amy asks, what's your favorite stitch for fonts? My favorite stitch, as I'm going to hopefully teach you guys, because I will be unfrozen if I'm still frozen. Nope, you're unfrozen. Um, oh, great. It's the French knot. Um, it's so fun. It's that favorite stitch. Um, and I play with it, because I don't just do, um, and I'll show you the standard uh, French knot, but like I did a portrait of somebody with this beautiful Afro um, and, and I was able to like use that stitch to really bring um, texture to that piece. And, and then you can also be really delicate about it and really like, I don't know, make a meadow. <laughs> um, but that's my favorite. I I think Amy was asking for do fonts. Um, do you oh, use fonts. yeah? So if, if you're using word, if you're writing words, do you have a specific? Um, I use uh, it's a split. Um, it's a split stitch. I know you like you love backstitch for yeah. for writing, right? I do almost That's everything with backstitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do uh, almost everything with backstitch. I do. I don't know if it's actually a, called a split stitch, but um, but I to you guys next. Um, it's I find it really fun, and it almost looks like a braid as you're doing as you're doing writing. Um, mm. So that one's the easiest. How is this feeling getting out of your backstitch comfort zone, Jenna? <laughs> it's, it's good. I like a satin stitch sometimes. Um, a question from Judy. The best name brands of thread to buy. Do you have any uh, brand loyalty to specific threads? Um, no. DMC, I don't know if it's the same in Canada, but DMC tends to be the easiest one to find. Um, I don't know if they have like a monopoly on the uh, embroidered cloth. Um, but I also, like Jana said, if I'm at a thrift store or a secondhand store, uh, I will look for if, you know, if there's a, um, a sewing kit somewhere and see if anybody, if I can find anything there. But DMC is a perfectly fine one. I just... Mm -hmm just kind of grab whatever is there. I don't have really brand loyalty um, per se, but it just tends to be the one that I find. Um, um, yeah, I like Anchor as well. I sometimes see Anchor, but um, I think that any, again, that's the beauty of it. Pretty much any thread will work. And now that you know, you know, you could potentially um stitch just one strand of thread you can imagine you know most of these and again I buy them usually secondhand but even if you buy them new it's like a dollar fifty or something and um with this much thread how much uh how much you can stitch with um and Nana's audio has gotten worse so Thank you for your patience. We're going to hope it gets better again. It was so good there. Maybe I'll answer a couple of questions and just hope that the, the gerbils running her internet catch up. Um, so a uh, question about um, best to use all six threads or you can stick with two to three uh, for satin stitch. I guess that again is totally your preference. I decided to go with six 
um, just to speed the process along, because of course that makes it, um, you know, it's making a thicker line, so it's faster in this situation. Um, but that's totally up to you what you want to do. If you were filling in, say, say you were embroidered a portrait of someone and you were putting their eyes in, and even if you were doing a satin stitch, it was still pretty small, then you might still want to stay with um, two threads or three threads. So I think that's the really fun part of finding what kind of line you like, what kind of look you like, and what kind of designs you enjoy. Um, and I really go back and forth, it sort of depends. I will go all the way from one stitch or one strand all the way up to six strands. Um, here's another, audio? oh, sorry. No, no, is my audio back at all? Is it yeah. working? Yeah, your audio is back now. Hi. I was just gonna tie off. I don't know if people want just to, to watch that again, um, but let me start from the beginning of how I would go about tying off. Um, so I will do my last satin stitch or my last, yeah, for this one. Um, and then once it's under the hoop, once my needle's in that down position, I'll flip the hoop um, and I will make a knot by sticking my needle through, this is again, probably very bad embroidery etiquette, but this is how <laughs> um, I will stick it through the last stitch and then use that to make my knot. Um, and not, I won't pull too hard, but just enough. Um, and sometimes if I'm using one thread or two threads when things are pretty delicate, I will actually do another knot and kind of hold my hold my needle so I could get the knot as close to the cloth as possible and just kind of pull that in um, and then cut it off. Um, Jana. Do you, should we keep going with sand stitch or do you want the, I don't know how much time we have. Do you want to show another stitch? Yeah, let's quickly do um, another stitch and or the French knot because we're, have already gone over time. So we will wrap up. Um, but yeah, let's definitely, we definitely have time for another stitch. I also wanted to um, answer Linda's question. She want to, she wants to embroider napkins but she's worried that with washing the embroidery will get tight and wrinkle around the stitching. Do you have that issue? No, no I think if you, if it's a standard, if it's not like a super delicate one, um, as long as your stitches are good, like, you know, they're, they're tight, they're good, um, solid stitches, I would just make sure I was, washing it on a delicate and letting it line dry and then iron that was that's how i would do it um or hand wash is also until you kind of figure out how that fabric and that thread are going to react together um and i think once you get a sense of that then you'll be able to um to plan for it but i wouldn't put it on like a hardcore wash and throw it in a tumble dry <laughs> um yeah it definitely can happen but I um I have you know probably every napkin and every pillowcase in my house is embroidered and uh for the most part it really isn't an issue so as Netta says just maybe you know figure out how the thread's gonna react and how the um, fabric is gonna react um and Margaret McMillan anxious to know the front not because as she says hers always fall apart oh my gosh okay so the nice thing about the reason why I got so excited about this design is because we have those lovely three dots which says to me a friend um so why don't if people have their threads separately or they're if they're ready um, let's go to the first dot, um, i.e. the one before craft. Um, and you stick your needle through 
from the bottom again. Um, and I pull it to the end. Um, let me make sure you guys can see. Um, okay, let me try to get as angled as possible because this is my favorite and I want you guys to love it like I do. Um, Jana, can you see yep. my hoop? Okay. So I stay pretty close to the cloth on this one. Um, I hold, I tend to, this is again, my method that I figured out over the years, but um, I will take the needle, pretty, again, pretty close to the cloth, and I will wrap the thread once, twice, three times, and then you stick it back in to that hole or near the hole, but yeah, back into the hole. And you kind of, the trick is making sure it's not too tight and not too loose. Um, and then let me pull it through. And then you pull it through. So I'm just showing people I've changed color here. So I'm putting my needle pretty close to the fabric and I'm wrapping the thread around three times around the needle and then I'm trying to hold it tight and push it back through mm -hmm. and then pulling it tight and I used six again for this um, just so that it would be nice and chunky and just to do it again we only have that those three dots but I'm going to go rogue <laughs> and I know Jenna, it's real scandal um and do another French knot right next to it so you guys can see again um close to the one two three around the needle um and then back through that, oops, not that step. One more time. One, two, three, around the needle, then back through that hole. Um, and then I pull it down. And the trick is that kind of not too tight, not too loose. Um, and then now it's, now there's a bit of a knot, so. That didn't work, but hold on, let me do it again. So in the meanwhile, I have my little one uh, there, my little knot, so I'm gonna tie it off and uh, move to another one. And, Cause I'm gonna do all three of those little knots in uh, blue. And I sort of just abandoned my satin stitch for now. I'll go back to it after. Um, so here I am knotting my thread again. I just cut it off. I'll go to one of the, um, this little spot in the middle here. So again, I have my blue thread. It's knotted on the end. I'm coming up through. Um, I'm going to go really closely, wrap it around three times and then stick it back sort of right close to it. It's a little bit careful. You don't want to jostle it too much at this point. And then I'm bringing it through. It's a little bit tight there. And then you can see it just popped into a cute little French knot. And I'm going to tie it off. And then I'm going to do that one more time. You know, it's, it seems like such a delicate and precise stitch. And it, it Yes, it, it is, I'm sure. But one of the things that I like to do is um, instead of doing, if I wanted, like I did a, a, um, a scene with a weeping willow, um, this was years ago, and I started just playing, going one, two, three, four wraps around and seeing how that played. Um, and, and it really, again, brings such fun texture um, and, and you can like, you, you can just, yeah, make 
make it feel like there's a cascade happening. Like there's, you know, a different kind, you can make different kinds of leaves, foliage, hair, um, or you can just, you know, do a cute little spot for a button. Um, there's so much fun things that you can do with it. And it's such an easy stitch. It feels so fun. To, um, so that's my favorite. That's three stitches, y'all. Um, one thing I'd like to tell people is a total secret. But, you know, if you embroider something with somebody's name on it for them, they think you are the best like most brilliant person in the entire world. And it's very easy, you can just print out their name. I sometimes, when we were talking about tattoo flash, you know, you can have the little classic heart with a scroll through it, write someone's name in it, embroider it on a hanky, you know, it'll take you one to two Netflix episodes and then they think you, that you're the most brilliant and thoughtful person in the world. So not to give away all my secrets, but um, that's a very nice, thoughtful gift, especially right now that we can be sending to people. Um, I see we've already been an hour and 20 minutes, so we probably should wrap up. Is there anything else you'd like to say, Netta, about embroidery or about... Um, well, I mean, I'm so sorry for all the technical difficulties. <laughs> um, but I hope you guys, at least these are three stitches that can take you lots of places. Um, and I really, I hope that even with all the glitching, there was some part of this that made you fall in love with embroidery that was really important to me. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. And it, it, I do apologize. I don't know why this happened. We tested against it and uh, had no problem, but you know, that's, life so hopefully you were able to get it and um, I will certainly be around the Facebook page to answer questions and there really is the great thing about embroidery again I warned you I'm a embroidery evangelist is that it really is unlimited creativity there's all kinds of different stitches you can try there's all sorts of different approaches you can experiment with as you find your style and um, I'm gonna keep working on this and I'll post it in a couple of days what I end up with and I hope all of you will uh, too. So I think um, we'll probably wrap up. I wanted to thank our Globe and Mail team that are working behind the scenes, Patrick, Deb, Lori, Lacey and Jesse, probably who are all having heart attacks like me at the technical problems. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us and um, bearing through some glitches. And a reminder that we'd love to see you on our Facebook page, uh, Globe Craft Club, and also to sign up for our parenting and relationships newsletter. Um, and to keep uh, in the loop about our upcoming classes. Um, please watch for information and supplies for our next class on March 16th, when we're going to be learning basic book binding and making recycled notebooks uh, with Catalina Sanchez from Toronto. I'm really excited about that. I love notebooks. Um, I'm your host, Jana Pruden. It's been such a pleasure uh, to spend time with you, and I hope that um, you're going to spend the rest of the evening stitching like I am. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Netta. It was wonderful to see you. Good to see you.